What is up, Packers fans, and welcome back to another episode of Packer Report TV. I'm your host and the publisher of Packer Report, Ross Uglum, and joining me for another bonus episodes, and uh, I love these. We don't, they're not like regularly scheduled, but we do love to have uh, Dalton, you're from, from PFF. I thought we had a great conversation last time, explaining some of the grades, explaining some of you know, some Packers things that that maybe like your guys' grades fit the narrative or didn't fit the narrative. And I'm, I'm excited to get uh, get back into some of that now. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, when you talk about it's going into such a big matchup and and just getting to break it all down, it's always fun to break down the, the finer details of things right on both sides of the ball. So it'll be a lot of fun, especially ahead of a big matchup against the Lions. One... Um almost position battle that I wanted to to briefly touch on. And it wasn't PFF, but I did read somebody else who I kind of respect. And, and I think it's fair. Um, you know, Gutekunst gets a ton of credit for being an excellent drafter. And I, I think that is fair. I mean, I, I think you, you see even now what, what's going on with Tucker craft and then the immediate impacts from an Edger and Cooper from an Evan Williams. I mean, I think you could put both. I, I don't know if either are favorites, but I think you could put, put both Cooper and Evan Williams in the defensive rookie of the year discussion. Um, Evan Williams, that's more of a like a really high PFF grade thing than defensive rookie of the year would actually get because normally you'd have to look at like interceptions. Like you, it'd be a box score thing usually to actually like win the award. Um, but the outside of Jordan Love and Jair Alexander the questions of his first rounders are legitimate. You know, you talk about an Eric Stokes. Um, I'm very fond of, of the way Devonte Wyatt plays football, but then there's the Quay Walker pick. There is um, Lucas Van Ness is not there yet. Right. And, and there've been, been other, you know, issues. And then um, this particular article was, has, has it happened again with Jordan Morgan? Um, I'm, I'm certainly not willing to go there, but you don't love spending the 25th pick on a player that you're not playing. And frankly, I think at this point shouldn't play. What have you guys at PFF seen from, from Sean Ryan? And frankly, what have you seen from Jordan Morgan? Um, honestly with Morgan, it's just such a tough case because he was dealing with injuries in the preseason and it's been such a concern with him. Right. But, uh, you know, we see he's getting in a little bit part time. He's playing, you know, between 15 and 20 snaps a game there at right guard rotating in with Sean Ryan, but it, it really, it, it hasn't taken off yet, obviously. Right. I think, I think it's been a little better in pass protection the last couple of weeks, but again, it's limited reps, uh, you know, the run blocking, it kind of has been coming and going. I, I think you have a guy that they're trying to, they're trying to have this, balance of getting reps and still winning football games right because it's pretty clear that you know Sean Ryan's been the better player that's why he's playing more right especially in pass protection uh you know this is this spot this interior offensive line was a concern coming into the season and I think it'll still be a concern come playoff time and I think even even you know it'll get tested this week against a Lions team who is hurting obviously on the edge with Hutchinson's injury and a bunch of other guys that have been hurt, but you got a lean McNeil and DJ reader on the inside. That's a big test for them. So, you know, we'll see, maybe Sean Ryan will just play hundred percent of the snaps this week. I know they're trying to get Morgan reps and they're trying to work him through the problems he's had early in the year with the injuries and stuff, but eventually it feels like you have to make a decision or, or, or Morgan just sits and he has to learn from the sidelines. I, I think, I think that's correct, and and especially if you want to maintain some of that versatility too, or if you just believe that Morgan is a long term guard. I mean, my, my team building philosophy is he better be damn good then. I mean, true. Like if you're going to use the twenty fifth overall pick on a on a lineman that you believe is a guard, he better be above league average, or you could have gotten that much much later. It's just just my my opinion. Um, Looking at your guys' grades, you've got the top overall offensive grade for the Packers, Josh Jacobs. There's some some stuff going around on that. I think Bill Barnwell wrote a column that it might have been aggregated a little bit by by ESPN because they sort of modify what you see based on your likes as, as far as headlines are concerned. But I mean, he said like Josh Jacobs has been a disappointment, or what does what do, was Josh Jacobs' performance in Green Bay mean for older backs? Packers fans don't feel that way. Your grading system has Jacobs as an 84.2 and Green Bay's number one overall graded offensive player. Where's the disconnect here? 
I, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's maybe if they just think it's a lack of explosive plays or if it's just a, a certain number they're looking at, like a 4.6 yards per carry, which is solid. It's very solid or maybe only three touchdowns, but he's been tremendous. I don't think he's getting enough credit through all of the difficulties they've had with Jordan Love's injury and even a couple of the receivers like Dontavion Wicks struggling that Josh Jacobs has been the rock of their offense, right? And I think when you talk about even when Malik Willis comes in these games and you have this rushing threat, the offense is a little bit different with Willis running some read option stuff that Jacobs' ability to just get five, six yards at a time and break tackles and run physically, especially behind an offensive line that is not the best run blocking unit, he certainly doesn't get enough credit, right? I think when you're talking about a guy right, who we've seen it before. He's done the things he can do. You know, two years ago, this was arguably the best back in football. Right now, he's fourth in the league in rushing yards, and he's sixth in the league for in rushing grade for us. So I don't I, – it's hard to tell what the disconnect is because without Josh Jacobs, I, I don't think any of the Malik Willis stuff really works when you talk about the run game and the, and the further dimensions that it adds. And even when Love is in there, it's very clear that Jacobs – is so much better than he was last year, right? He had the contract negotiations, got off to a late start. Things just didn't happen the way he wanted to in Vegas. But And this was a signing that maybe I questioned a little bit because of that going into it, because of the struggles he had last year. But he's been fantastic. I, I really don't know anybody who's saying he's struggling or there's some sort of issue with Jacobs. I'm not really sure where that's coming from because he's another guy. I don't know where the Packers' offense would be without him and just being so so consistently good at picking up positive yardage for him. And I think there's a chance, right, that it has something to do with fantasy football, too, because if you are um, touchdown dependent, right, like the fantasy football world is touchdown dependent. Six points is the same as 60 yards. Well, that, you know, sometimes in today's NFL, 60 yards is a game's worth of production on the ground. Uh, so so running backs can be touchdown dependent. Josh Jacobs, not that often uh, visiting the end zone for fantasy players. But, but Barnwell writes about football, and I'm not necessarily just dumping on on bill but it, his writings are about football not fantasy football so if you're going to complain about lack of touchdowns I, I don't know what i will say is i think you're exactly right dalton in that um it, it was a great signing and and the packers need a back like that like i i wouldn't have done that one i wouldn't have done that one for that much money but at the same time you know green bay right now has won one offensive lineman with a PFF run block grade above 60. Zach Tom, that's it. And that is their philosophy. Whether you like it or don't like it, no NFL team, and maybe you disagree with me on this, no NFL team, in my opinion, is going to have five offensive linemen who run block and pass block well. They just they aren't. You're not going to find five linemen that do both things well on the same team. So what Green Bay, their strategy at this point is, we're going to draft pass protectors. We're going to draft pass protectors, and, and most of them are going to be tackles. And we're going to kick some of those tackles inside to guard, and we're going to get a bunch of guys that are light on their feet that can keep our quarterback alive. And then, because of that, we're going to go get a running back that can make yards because we ain't opening up the holes. And, and, and we're going to try and scheme some fun run game stuff up. We're going to try and, and, and do really cool things with Matt LaFleur. But as far as like our right guard is going to push your three technique into next week, it, it just isn't what they draft. It isn't what they acquire. So I think Josh Jacobs is huge for these guys. I think you're exactly right. No, I, I agree with you. I think as much as uh, it's become a passing league now and and the premier thing is is protecting your quarterback and allowing your quarterback to function, I mean, that's probably the same way I would do it, to be honest. If you find those pass protectors, protect Jordan Love, and manufacture in the run game and find balance, right? Use the passing game and, and all the motions and everything Matt LaFleur throws in to, to find balance in the run game and manufacture it. But you're right, exactly what you said about, about having a back that can break tackles and do things. That's what makes the great backs great, right? It's not just, oh, the volume. And, and getting a million carries and doing all that. Are you efficient with it? And do you make things happen? Maybe when average backs wouldn't make things happen, right? Josh Jacobs has always been really good at breaking tackles, really good at getting through contact. And, and I'm with you. I think it's so rare that offensive lines are so great and so balanced like that. I mean, and you're talking about, I think, legendary units when it comes to that. So I think about that 2017 Eagles team that won the Super Bowl. That was one of the very few teams that had five guys that could just do everything. And that's one of the greatest offensive lines of all time, right? I even think about maybe the closest thing we have to it now is the Lions offensive line when they're healthy. You know, and even then, it's such a tough, a tough standard to achieve 
in both facets, right? So I think you're absolutely right. Are the Packers the best run blocking team? Absolutely not. But they manufacture enough with the scheme. They run so much motions. When, when Malik Willis is in there, you see even more of the run schemes and gap things and things that I think LaFleur even takes from watching some college tape from certain teams. I, I think you have a thing where the passing game in the NFL today needs to be, to be the priority. And that's all the way around. It's the priority in the offensive line, the quarterback, the receivers, everything in the run game has to balance that out as opposed to, you know, the other way around like it used to be. Last one on the offensive side of the ball, and we'll move over to the defense. Um, your, your third grade, third graded guy for the Packers is Malik Willis. And you and I were talking a little bit briefly when we met before the show about like, where would they be without him? Do, 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 Michael Pratt or Sean Clifford win either of those first two games or do either of those guys survive in the Jaguar situation? You think the answer is no. I'm not as sure as you just because I have a lot of faith in Matt LaFleur and and the the, the plan that he could have maybe come up with for one of those other guys. And I'm, I'm not saying 3-0 and because I think the answer is absolutely not. They don't survive the Jacksonville situation and win those other two games. Um but I gotta like I I want to kind of have you assign some credit because I think it's tough for us to do as as like look I'm supposed to be this journalist but you see this sweatshirt you see this hat you see the stuff up like be, people know what I want to happen on Sundays right I'm a fan I'm not gonna pretend to not be a fan but things did not go well in Tennessee H- hard to say they were right though I mean with with what Levis and Rudolph are doing it's like. Really? Malik Willis was the third best guy you had? Really? <laughs> really? But at the same time, how much credit does Malik Willis get? How much credit does Matt LaFleur get? Would Malik Willis have been better in Tennessee this year? I, I just have – there's so many questions that arise because of this crazy performance that he has made in three must-win situations for the Packers who are now sitting pretty at 6-2. and two. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll start. We'll we'll go down the order of some of those questions. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll start. Just, just, yeah. We'll start with we'll start with the Tennessee thing because that's the simplest one. Uh, no, he wouldn't have been this good in Tennessee. That that Tennessee situation it, it is a mess. It's a very young offensive line. It, it's a it's a receiving core with really you know before you had Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins and now Hopkins is gone. I, I'm not sure how many quarterbacks could go into Tennessee and succeed right now. As far as the credit, I think Matt Lafleur does deserve the most credit for you know and maybe Brian Gutekunst too for uh, you know evaluating Willis and, and assessing this is a guy that they could get who does improve their situation right. And I think Lafleur did such a spectacular job. I was so blown away first by the Colts game, the first game that he started by just the immense change in the style of their run game because Willis was in there at quarterback, right? And and Willis, the Titans, when he played, look, they didn't do a great job of using him to his skill set. They kind of almost tried to run the same offense for the most part as they did with Ryan Tannehill, and they're not the same type of quarterback. Look, because of the style that he is and the offense he played at Liberty in college and all of that, I'm not sure Malik Willis could start 17 games, but I have to give LaFleur credit for identifying him as a guy who goes, you know what, I could make some sort of plan and win two or three games if I had to with him and do that and still teach him some of the fundamentals in our offense that work, right? I think something – Within that is kind of the, the play that won the game last week, the the uh, the leak route to Jaden Reed that got you into field goal range. That's something that's realistically in a Matt LaFleur, a Kyle Shanahan, a Sean McVay offense that Malik Willis did a nice job executing, right? But I think the fact that even when Love got hurt this time in the middle of a game, he had a plan for Malik, right? It was, we're going to run the ball heavier and we're going to get into stuff that he's comfortable with. And, and I think that what Malik has done with his athleticism, he deserves credit for executing. A- absolutely. I mean, this is better than he's ever executed in his career before. And, and uh, you know, and, and to your other question about, about a Sean Clifford or a Michael Pratt, I, I don't think they would have done what Malik Willis is doing. Cause I think there's things schematically that are unique to Willis that are not unique to any other quarterback on the Packers roster, not even Jordan Love. I, I just I, you give so much credit to Matt LaFleur and Malik Willis, one for just an incredible game plan, and two, for Willis just executing and, and being look, in none of these games has he thrown at least 20 attempts, right? I mean, executing what you're told to do 
and, and, and being prepared in any situation, you always have to give a, a team wide credit for that. And the other guy I'm going to say again, you know, we talked about him before is Josh Jacobs, because it's a thing now where the box is tightened and everybody knows you're running because you have Malik Willis and you have Josh Jacobs and everyone knows you're going to come out and run the football and you get it done anyway. So those three guys to me on the field, really, and obviously Matt LaFleur with the preparation, they all deserve a ton of credit for getting through these hard times. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's been impressive, and I just wanted to get kind of an outside perspective because we've talked about it on the show and tried to sort of assign some credit, you know, and, and where should the credit go and, and you know, who's who's responsible for this. Uh, the next guy I want to talk about, Rashawn Gary. Uh, signs a big contract, was productive last year, and then did not finish strong, has not started strong. But you guys have a – uh, like a 67 overall defensive grade with 60 being average leads the Packers with 18 um, pressures. 12 of those pressures are over the last three weeks with three, six, and then three. Why do you think the, the perception of the, why do you think the perception has strayed so far from reality? And I'm not saying you want to spend the kind of money that the Packers are spending for a, solidly above average defensive line. I mean, you want him to play like a star. But why yeah, do you no, think the perception has sort of left reality a little bit? I think for two things. Anytime you get off to a slow start at the very beginning of the season, people get you under the microscope, right? You mentioned it, the last three games with 12 pressures in the last three games and the grading looking a lot better. I think it's something – I think that's something that – um, you know, people, sometimes you get a few people that tune out on that sort of thing and take it out of the microscope when you get into the middle of the year and you're kind of kind of going through the week in week out process in the NFL. But I also think it's more because we've seen a higher standard of play, you know, from him before, right? He, three years ago, an 89.80 looked like an elite player. Two years ago, 82.9. Last year, even a 79 and, and 66 pressures last year. So I think you just say, you know, sometimes you get a guy off to a little bit of a slow start. You're also talking about, you know, they played a long season last year. Sometimes it takes certain guys quicker to, re you know, a longer time to recover. But I, I think I, I'm, Gary's a guy I'm, I'm really not worried about. I think he's starting to pick it up now, and he's been good. I think part of that overall grade, and, and you know, I think a big factor for Gary also is 68.3. Um, run defense grade here that that means a lot too right talking about doing the dirty work and and I think the other thing is we're so used to seeing Gary in the old defense stand up in a two-point stance might take him some time here that he's kind of flipping back and forth between a two and a three-point stance playing in a three-point stance more often as opposed to um, such a high percentage of that true outside linebacker kind of look I think there can be an adjustment there are certain guys who are more comfortable with one or the other and it can be hard to switch back and forth so I, I think part of it too is Jeff Halfley coming in or Sean Gary just having to make the the kind of positional adjustment and some of the fundamentals that come with the technique of the position. Yeah, everybody and I, I'll I'll count myself as as a culprit. Everybody was like, "Hey, you know, um, he he this, this should be great." He had his hand on the dirt in college. They drafted him in 2019, guys. College, it's been a minute. <laughs> like he, like yeah, he played with his hand in the dirt at Michigan. It's been a while since he's been at Michigan, so I, I think the adjustment period is probably something that we as Packers fans should have been more ready for and been ready to give some grace for. But once you sign that big contract, man, especially like the, these these Middle America, <laughs> where it's like you know the the baseball team is small market and everybody's like, oh, I can't believe how much they're paying him, and that that stuff gets rough. Um, is because I, I so I'll, I'll say this, and this is not to pump my own chest, but my my scouting report on on Edger and Cooper was he is the best quarterback affecting linebacker I've ever seen in the in in draft prep in the sense that he was the best blitzer with the combination of being like the best QB spy I have ever seen, and now by grade, he's the best pass rushing linebacker in the National Football League. Is this just what he is? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And, and you know what, you just mentioned it. And that, that was the one skill that that was the skill that jumped out to me maybe more than anything in college is that the, the court, the spy method, right? So it, crazy. It, yeah, it, it, it was insane. You're absolutely I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Because that's something that jumped out at me. I was like, Wow, I mean, you talk about him running down guys in the SEC like Jalen Milrow and athletic quarterbacks like that. like Jaden Daniels. Old, yeah. yeah, and he even got Daniels a couple times. Like, Daniels was the only guy that going against him that I saw when Cooper was a spy that was like a fair fight. 
honestly, yeah. the, rest of, the rest of them, it, it was insane. He, I mean, he was so fast. He's so instinctive. You know, I had questions about him in coverage, it, mainly because he spied and did those things so much that, well, we'll see if he can cover. But no, incredibly ex- instinctual football player, the type of guy that they needed. That spy role against athletic quarterbacks is big time. He's got a natural ability to rush the passer. He's got really good instincts. He's just, uh, I mean... I almost want to say he's a linebacker's linebacker, you know. Actually, he remi- his, t- his college tape reminded me, and I know now it's kind of like weird to say this, but college tape reminded me a little bit of Devin White back when he was at LSU where I'm just like, man, there are plays where this guy's just a freak, man. Like he's just got those freak plays about him. He can really run. And, and no, I think he's had a big impact. When you talk about, to me, the biggest thing the Packers needed to fix in, it, it, on this team was the middle of their defense. And, and you've seen the number of different guys who are contributing, but – Cooper's absolutely one of them. I mean, and you talk about, I think an increased role for him is only going to make him better. He's playing more and more snaps every week. You mentioned as a blitzer, he can do those things. We're starting to figure it out and run defense. You know, you get to an NFL level, is something every rookie struggles with. But no, I, I'm with you. I think that's I think that's the absolute correct scouting report on him. And he's brought so far a really positive impact to the team. I want to talk about that middle, and then we'll, we'll preview the Lions game just ever so briefly. But I want to talk to you about the middle of the defense because your – grading reflects something that I have said, which is I don't believe it to be in this team's best interests to remove Eric Wilson from the Mike linebacker position and reinsert Quay Walker when Quay clears concussion protocol. I understand you don't lose your job to injury. I understand we built this entire defense, gave him the green dot as the mic, as the computer, as the, the communicator. I understand he's a former first-round pick. Get all that. Then I watch the tape, which means more to me than these grades. Which, is, but, but, but then I look at these grades, and it's eighty-eight point zero for Eric Wilson, and it is a forty-eight point seven for Quay Walker. He has been one of the worst starting linebackers in football, to my eye and to PFFs. Not everyone agrees. It's fine, but. I just don't know what to do because I think they're going to reinsert Quay Walker and bench Eric Wilson. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's that's a tough one because you're talking about – and the grades, honestly, what they are, and I try to say this as much as possible, they are a reflection of the tape, right? And, and I think what you're, you're absolutely right. Eric Wilson's come in and made these last two starts and made a huge impact. Cooper, you mentioned, has made an impact when he's played. I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I would roll with the hot hand, right? We've seen Walker now struggle for roughly two and a half years in the NFL. It's not just this season, right? Yeah. If, it was, if it was some sort of um, improvement off of what we've seen in the past, cool, but – it just seems like kind of stagnant, and now he's and now he's been stagnant in two different defenses. I'm with you. I, I roll with the hot hand. I think Wilson and Cooper are the future for this team at the position. I, I just think that are they probably going to do it? Yeah, like for all those reasons you mentioned. But I think it's got to be a short leash, or maybe you start getting just a further rotation on these guys, right? I think I think when you have guys who are performing well and make an impact on your team, especially when they're young players like Cooper, I, I think you have to really consider what's in the best interests of this football team and who should play, right? I think it's a similar thing about what we just talked about on the offensive line is like, look, eventually we're in a playoff race. We're trying to win a Super Bowl. The best players and the best playing players, the hot hands, they need to be on the field till the wheels fall off and then we can figure it out from there. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, let's just for posterity's sake, because this we're recording this on a Thursday. I, I'm not sure if you guys will get this Thursday or Friday. Let's say everyone plays because I don't want to get into the rest of it. So, like, Myers and Jenkins and Rashid Walker have missed some practice time. I expect them to play. Jordan Love, obviously, is that's a huge deal. Is it Jordan Love? Is it Malik Willis? Jair Alexander, you would definitely want him, especially in a situation where there's no Jamison Williams and you can really, really focus on ARSB. Well, you would want Jair Alexander in that situation, um, though he doesn't usually travel to the slot. So, the, it might not matter, but uh, with that said, what are your key matchups in this game? Let's just say everyone's healthy because I don't want to get into the the nonsense of it all. What what are your key matchups in this game? So I think when you're talking about you know the same things when we've talked about the middle of this Packers defense and the improvements they've made, the linebackers we just talked about, Xavier McKinney, who was it was my single favorite free agent signing of any team in the NFL this offseason. When you talk about the improvement there. Now this is the game where you need to see it, right? At linebacker in both dimensions, 
in the run game because the, the Lions have gotten the run game rolling again now with Jameer Gibbs. You saw last week a 70-yard touchdown run. He's Jameer Gibbs, an animal. We know what David Montgomery can do. And the Lions passing game works so well to attack the middle of the field off of that, right? So when you talk about now, this is the test because why did realistically – why did they need to improve the middle of the field defense so much? Because you have teams like the 49ers and the Lions who just attack it constantly, and they're better at it than anybody. So that, for me, is the big thing. You've got the run game. you got Jared Goff ripping 15-yard in cuts behind those linebackers getting in on that second level. Those are the guys that I look at in this game because if those guys don't play well, you honestly can't beat the Lions the way they're rolling right now on offense. Those, those, All these new faces that we talked about, the middle of this defense, and, and it would help, like you said, Rashawn Gary starting to get hot, need to stay hot now because he's going to be mainly going up against Penny Sewell, who might be the best offensive lineman in all of football. So there's a lot of factors going in where I, I think especially – the inner workings of this defense and all these guys who have worked to make this defense improve in the middle, they're going to be in the spotlight this week against the Lions offense. I agree. I think for me, a big thing is um, the tackles for Green Bay. And and the reason that I say that is because a lot of smart people talked all offseason about, okay, the Lions have a good roster, great roster. I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle them, but the Lions have a good roster. Um, the only question that we would have would be the non Aiden Hutchinson pass rush. It, it, there is no Aiden Hutchinson. So with that said, and the, the trade deadline ferry has not brought anything yet. There, there's, there's no, there's no Zadarius Smith. There's no Max Crosby. There's no Harold Landry. The, the, the trade deadline ferry has not visited the, the lions yet for pass rush help. So, in a game, and and people are going to see this when I do the, my fantasy and gambling corner, I'm going to tell people to sit Josh Jacobs. Right now, the Lions are giving up the third least fantasy points to opposing running backs. Now, fantasy football is not necessarily real football, but guys, that comes from a lack of production from the opposing running backs. There, there is a, a real skill level that, here for these Lions in shutting down opposing running games. If the Packers want to win this game, they're going to have to throw. What happened in thank, at Thanksgiving game? Was that some big error? No. That was Christian Watson bombing the ball down the field. Jaden Reed, like that was Jordan Love just dancing on Thanksgiving graves in Detroit. And, guys, that's what it's going to have to be. And I think whether it's a kind of a sort of gimpy Jordan Love or even Malik Willis, which that part of it's a little bit frightening, it's potentially Green Bay's ability to really block up Detroit and allow for second reaction plays, allow for deeper developing pass concepts, getting Watson, Wicks, Dobbs involved, Reed down the field. I think Green Bay is going to have to throw to win. That's my my thought. And potentially, without a super special pass rusher on the other side, it, it might be something they can do. Yeah, no, I think uh, – let me let me start with the run game there because I think you made a great point. You got two – you know, you, they, they're hurting bad off the edge, but you got two big monsters on the inside with Aleem McNeil and DJ Reader. And Reader especially – has brought that impact in the run game that he brought all those years in Cincinnati. When, when It was so clear with the Bengals. When Reader was on the field, they were a top-five run defense, and when he was off the field, they, they were pretty bad. So, I, I mean, it's it's such a big impact he has, and McNeil's turned into a star player on the inside. And you mentioned it in the passing game. It might look a little bit different this time around because – You've got what you have going with the Lions is they needed to improve in coverage last year. Coverage last year, they were just bad all the way around, pretty much, right? This year, you have this dynamic where their safeties, Brian Branch and Kirby Joseph, are very, very dangerous. They're, they're getting turnovers. Brian Branch is one of the best players in football right now, He's without so question. Yeah. He, is, he is amazing with all the things he can do in the slot, at safety, all over. Kirby Joseph complimenting him. So I think the difference is going to be – you really want to attack the Lions on the outside, okay, because they're still pretty vulnerable. A corner, Carlton Davis, not having a great year coming over from Tampa. Terrion Arnold's been, you know, he's really battling as a rookie out there. He looks like a rookie. Yeah, yeah, he looks like a rookie, right? And he's a wicked competitor, and I love the kid. I think he's going to be really good at some point. But he's getting tested every single week. He's battling. Some plays he's making, some plays he's not. So you really want to find a way, I think, to isolate one-on-one -on -one matchups on the outside for those guys, because if you if you throw balls into tight windows in, into into Branch and Joseph, it could get dangerous. You want to try to control those guys, and I think for the run game, if they can run to the outside this week, it would be a heavy benefit because running right at you mentioned sure. the lack of production from the running backs running between the tackles on McNeil and Reader, especially with a Packers offensive line on the inside that can be shaky in there at times that's going to be a tall order for them inside so if they can run out to everything they can get work everything to the perimeter run and pass i think then you talk about the, the packers offense starts moving 
I agree. That was a little bit of a frustrating thing for me at times with Jacksonville. It was like, wh- why are the guys you're running at Josh Hines, Allen, and Trayvon Walker when there's so many other issues on this Jaguars team? And, and so you make a it's, and you you make yeah. a great point because I'll be honest. One thing I saw in the second half, and I know again Malik Willis adding a different dimension in the running game is something. Yeah. But the second Willis came in there, and the Packers decided we're running right downhill. The Jags linebackers were all over the place. And yeah. they just went right yep. downhill on them, and they went yep. right down the heart of their defense. Now, this week, again, it's got to be probably the opposite of that. The inverse, you're yeah. You're right. You can, you can adjust those things week to week, and we've seen before that LaFleur has it, at least in the playbook. All right, Dalton, this was so much fun. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it very much here at Packer Report TV. Appreciate you again having me on, Ross.